questions, discuss, and critique the current definition of expert learners. And I'm gonna share this verbally and then I'm gonna, we're gonna give you multiple representations of it during this conversation. Expert learners who are each in their own way, resourceful and knowledgeable, strategic and goal-directed, and purposeful and motivated. And this, we want to note, is a description that was adapted and inspired from an article by Ertmer and Newbery in 1996. And this was included in CAS 2011 UDL guidelines. So we really look forward to this fruitful conversation continuing today with a few panelists from CAS. So our goals are to discuss past vision of expert learning and the current application um, in practice. But we're also going to push on this a little bit and critique the description of CAS definition of expert learning. And we invite you to really share and collaborate with us about both the vision, but also the critique of where we might want to continue to go um, or shift our direction when we look to thinking about the next iteration of defining expert learners. So to get you all contributing to the conversation, uh, we invite you to use the text chat. So for those of you who are here live with us today, please feel free to open the chat panel that's from the center of the top of your Zoom window. And please make sure to choose all panelists and attendees from the drop down above where you type. This allows everyone to hear your words, to see what you've shared. If there's something that you want just to go to the, uh, to the panelists, perhaps it's um, you know, a question that you don't wanna go publicly, you're welcome to select just to panelists. We also invite you to share via Twitter and we invite folks who are watching the recording, welcome and please continue this conversation beyond just this one hour today. Please use the hashtag CastPL at cast underscore UDL to be able to share at any point today or beyond uh, through Twitter. So please start joining us. It's fabulous to see you all already uh, contributing into the chat box there. Thank you so much. And we want you all to know that resources are available for you. So we have a digital handout with this bit.ly link, bit.ly slash el hyphen webinar, where you can have access to the key topics of today and links to all of the different resources and materials that we discussed during the webinar. We've compiled them into this um, digital handout that's available indefinitely for you all to be able to access those key ideas and any of the resources. Uh, including that Ertmer Newberry article that we talked about that uh, really inspired CAST and our thinking uh, around expert learning. So please feel free to dive deeper into that handout if you would like to learn more. So before I introduce, I know I always do this to you all and I have this big buildup before I actually bring out the who you really want to hear today, our, our guest panelists. But I do wanna give you just a moment of background for those of you or for anyone just wanting a little refresher on what is this expert learning thing and, and how does it align with UDL? Here's the most recent version of CAS UDL guidelines. And you probably see the familiar colors, you see the familiar um, organization of our principles, engagement, representation, and action and expression. And you also see that uh, horizontal organization where we think about access, building skills and ultimately internalizing learning. And if you notice, hopefully you notice that at the bottom we have this goal. And this goal is to develop expert learners. So we're gonna zoom in on that. Expert learners who are purposeful and motivated, resourceful and knowledgeable, and strategic and goal-directed. So UDL is a powerful tool which can be used to design learning experiences that, in, that challenge all learners all, I can, you know, keep wanting to emphasize the all learners to become experts in learning. And so today I'm honored to be joined by three of my cast colleagues, Susan Shapiro, Bill Wilmot, and Jenna Gravel to deepen our conversation around expert learning today. And they're going to be slowly introduced into the conversation with us all. So please um, sit back, get comfortable, start sharing and contributing to the conversation. And, um, and we're going to kick off really um, taking a moment to think about what expert learning looks like, sounds like, and feels like. And to kick us off, I'm really happy to introduce my colleague Susan Shapiro into this conversation. Susan, welcome. Thank you. And I'm gonna start um, by telling you a story, um, not um, about me as a teacher, um, but about me as a mom. So um, I have four daughters and the youngest is Harriet. And I wanna start off by saying, I have permission to tell this story. Um, I asked her last night. 
So um, if you know families that are larger than one, um, you know that sometimes the youngest child doesn't get quite as much attention as the other children. So I was a little bit surprised when her Spanish teacher called me and when she was in ninth grade and said, you're gonna need to come in for a meeting. Harriet's not doing very well in Spanish. So I know that Harriet wants to be an attorney and I know that she wants to learn uh, two languages because she believes that she will have a better ability to work on social justice issues if she has um, two languages that she knows fluently. And she hasn't been a student that has struggled too much in school. So I was a little bit surprised um, that we were having a meeting, but we went in and I said to her in the meeting, you know, the teacher said, she's got a C minus. And, um, and I love this story because it really pointed out for me and painted um, the difference between being a good student and being an expert learner. So as I tell it, you can be kind of listening for those terms that Allison was using, purposeful and motivated, strategic and resourceful, goal-directed, knowledgeable. Um, so her teacher said, she's got a C minus and um, she's just not doing the work. So I looked at Harriet and Harriet said, well, you know, mom, um, I wanna be an attorney and I wanna work on social justice and I wanna learn Spanish. I really don't just wanna get a good grade. I really wanna learn Spanish. And the homework is a digital worksheet that we do on this website. Um, and the teacher was kind of nodding. And she said, we do it every single night, but I just can't learn that way. But I went online and I found these other websites and I watched these videos and I make these note cards. And I had seen her, we'd been going to the dollar store and getting a lot of note cards lately. So I'd been seeing her make these note card systems. She goes, so I make these note cards and I study from them. And the teacher chimed in and said, you know, she does get A's on all the exams. She is learning the content. She's mastering the goal. She's just not doing the homework. So I wanna pause there for a second and just kind of use those terms. Harriet was a student um, in that moment who was more of an expert learner than a good student. Now, when I was in school, I was a really good student. I would have just done the homework, not learned any Spanish and gotten an A in the class. Um, but an expert learner really says, I know how I learn. I know that I need to make decisions and reflect on my learning as I go along. Um, and so Harriet is not a perfect kid. She doesn't do dinner dishes, all of that stuff. But Harriet is, um, in that story, um, an expert learner. And so I did just put a little prompt in the chat. So please, as you're hearing the story about Harriet that Susan's sharing, please, we invite you to reflect on your own experience or perhaps a student that you maybe know about. And, and I just want to highlight something that you said very subtly, but I think is really interesting is to think about a good student versus a good learner and what we really think of when we think of those, those two terms there. So I invite you all to continue to, to reflect and chat on this, um, about this in, in the chat box. It's such an easy um, barrier uh, or, or confusion, I should say, um, to think about good student and expert learner as being one and the same. The other thing that I've noticed in our work um, in, with teachers is that sometimes the term expert can become confusing too. So people think, oh, like when I was a first grade teacher, I had kids who said to me, I'm an expert in dinosaurs. And they were, right? They, were, they knew every kind of Tyrannosaurus Rex that there was. But we're talking about expert about learning. I really know how I learn. Um, and that's really different than being an expert in content. They're not better or worse, but just different. Um, so a couple of just general things about expert learners. And as I share these kind of what do expert learners do um, things, I encourage and invite you to just think about the design implications. So if expert learners do this stuff, what would that mean in my context for design? Um, so the first thing is, um, uh, if we could just advance that slide, um, expert learners make choices about learning. So expert learners, and, and there's the design implication there, right, is like they need options. Um, expert learners think about how they want to engage in a learning experience. They think about which representation of the content they would understand best. Harriet said, I'm not understanding those digital worksheets. I do understand those Spanish videos. Um, and expert learners are able to think about um, and make decisions about how they want to interact with materials, ideas, and each other, um, how they want to express their thoughts. I know that I study better when I study with a friend. I know that I don't study well when I study with a friend. 
expert learners also reflect on their learning. Um, they reflect on themselves as learners. These are questions that I've used 100 years from Donald Graves, who was a professor many years ago at the University of New Hampshire and wrote a lot about uh, literature uh, and literacy. Um, but he asked readers these questions, and I think they're great learning questions too. What do I do well as a learner? Um, what have I learned most recently about learning itself, learning as a verb? Um, and what is it that I want to learn next as a learner? Not just in math class, maybe just in math class, but across my um, learning experiences. So I, I am going to pause here for just a moment because there's a really active chat going on. And what seems to really be resonating is this idea of, of, of a good school student versus this expert learner. And you also mentioned, I'm gonna pick up because some, I think Susan speaks beautifully in a subtle piece that she also said in there is that there are, are design implications for all of these questions. So I'm going to encourage us to, in addition to thinking about um, how you're connecting to Harriet and thinking about this in your own context, how can you also start thinking about some of the design implications in our classroom spaces to really be able to support and scaffold students to be able to think about these deep questions about what they do well as learners, what they're learning about their own learning and what they want or need as a learner themselves. So thank you all for continuing to, to add to the chat. And Susan, there's a question here about, is it our responsibility to provide those options or how much or little could students self-advocate for those? So I don't know if you have a thought on that in relation to Harriet or, um, or other students. Well, I think that, um, and this is my answer, but please other people, I invite you to answer it in the chat as well. Um, I think it is our obligation to provide learners with opportunities to practice being learners. Um, and because I, I can't quote the, the statistic exactly, but I think we've all been to enough professional learning opportunities where we've heard things said like this. Students today will have three careers throughout their lives. They will have to learn jobs that aren't even jobs yet. Um, they'll have to learn content that doesn't exist. And so to deny learners an opportunity to become really, really good at learning, at learning things that don't even exist yet, um, I think it is our obligation. Um, and I think it's also our obligation to give learners time to reflect on that learning. So we've all had those days where if you had had a minute, you could have gotten sort of squeezed more juice out of the day, but because you just collapsed in exhaustion, whatever you might have kind of gathered like in reflection, it was lost. I think sometimes we have that impulse and I think we feel it sometimes in systems to kind of just keep going. But you know, what, what's there in that moment could really be, uh, I guess, juiced uh, in, in a moment of reflection. Um, so to build those time, that time in. When we work with teams, um, at CAST, I think the two things we hear ourselves say most often to teams that really want to uh, implement some of these design pieces for expert learning, if you're gonna add two things in, add in options that remove barriers, not just options for fun, but options that remove barriers and reflection time, just as a start. Um, and then teams go from there. Um, let me also say that learners, uh, expert learners monitor their progress. I will read this um, young child uh, writing. It says, I learned how to read a harder book than I, than I used to read. Um, expert learners are thinking about um, their own progress through curriculum, through goals, um, making goals. Um, and if you just advance to the next slide, I'll just say that Harriet reflected on that moment. And she said on the way home, you know, this made me realize that I need to get better at time management. I mean, I still learn the Spanish, but I didn't save enough time to do the other work. I also need to get more sleep. Well, what was interesting to me was that it wasn't about, I need to learn those Spanish verbs better or that vocabulary about the seasons I have to practice more, but it was all reflection on herself as a learner. Um, and I think too, um, and I know that like we're probably all nodding as I say this because I think it's a piece that we've forgotten to pay as much attention to as we need to, but this wellness piece, right? This idea that not only does she need to figure out some executive function around time management, her just needs to get more sleep. She just needs to take better care of herself so that she can make those kinds of decisions. And I think, you know, it's probably as important as any other um, piece of the reflection. So I just um, will leave you with that as a, a little story. Do you have advice if a learner, so your daughter made some very high level, strong 
uh, ref she had some strong reflections about this moment and this experience. What if the student doesn't end up making a choice that's a good one or a choice that's not related as the question, thank you for the question in the comment um, area, or you know, it's not related to the curricular content. What do you recommend for that? I guess, um, so I think that one of the things that happens sometimes, I'm going to try to answer this question and if I don't get there, will you like say, you didn't answer it at all, Susan. <laughs> um, I think that we are getting better as educators at giving learners agency in making decisions around goals, around how they're going to accomplish those goals. And I think sometimes when it comes to assessment and evaluation, we kind of take that agency back and we tell learners a little bit about how they did. Um, that was great you decided to do that on your iPad. It seems like it worked out really well. Versus learners saying, I think the iPad really helped me because I did that really well. So when learners aren't able to set goals, to me that says they're not able to have that self-assessment piece. And how do we then, so I'm shifting your question a little bit, but how do we then give learners that self-assessment piece? And if they're not able to say what Harriet said, right, in their, in their context, how can we sort of give them mastery oriented feedback that helps them to come to that so i noticed that um, during math time today you seemed like you got out of your seat a lot or that sounds so old-fashioned but you know that you were moving around a lot it seems like you were kind of distracted how did that go for you kind of prompting them right in that way that they would go you know I probably should have gone to the quiet area to do my math, right? Not that I would say that, but that I would give them feedback and descriptive feedback enough that they would say, I probably need to do that. Um, so to me, it's probably no different than anything else with what we do. And we do that really well as teachers because that's kind of our instinct, right? We, we're the ones who say, and I always use this example, but we're the ones who say to a young child, I picked up my tea and you were here. I put my tea back down and you were across the room. And that young child, that two-year-old says, me a fast runner, right? Versus, you know, what my father would say, like, boy, you sure are a fast runner, right? But how do we give that child the agency to really say that him or herself? And to take a couple fabulous um, points from the chat, also being able to reflect that the barriers in the design of the environment and is not inherent to the learner themselves. So just really appreciating that UDL perspective that's really significant. I think that can be really empower empowering for students to be able to better understand where their barriers are and not feel like it is um, a deficit in themselves. And I also want to thank the comment that there, there, there should be room for mistake and it's okay in learning. Once, in fact, sometimes the best learning happens when we make those mistakes and allow students to make the space to be able to make those mistakes. So one of the things that we're going to take a moment here to share with you all is the way currently that CAST has shared their definition of becoming expert learners. And you'll see that these align to the UDL guidelines with engagement, representation, and action and expression. And then you'll see within each of these that there are descriptors that can help us really think about how we're looking, how, how the design is supporting and facilitating expert learning in all of our different contexts. What's really amazing to me is we can scaffold the design in early learning centers in K through 12, higher ed, informal learning spaces, any place learning is happening, we can take these statements uh, that really help us to think about how we're scaffolding and designing for expert learners and turn them into questions and ask ourselves, how is our design reducing barriers and in service of this expert learning? So Susan, do you wanna highlight any of the engagement representation or action and expression descriptors here for us to think about? And please know that these are all, the link to this digital handout is provided for you all in our digital handout. So you can have your own copy of this and we really recommend taking time to look at them and explore them. Each point, each descriptor, I think um, could in invite a lot of conversation with your teams. Are there a couple then, Susan, that you'd like to, to point out or highlight? I guess I'll just share a quick um, example of a school that I was working with um, that was making some prediction um, about to what degree their learners would be expert learners if they just kind of kept their instruction the same. And the principal chimed in and she said, you know, we have this fifth, there's a, um, let me just back up and say, under representation at the bottom there, um, 
it says that expert learners know how to transform new information into meaningful and usable knowledge. And we hear a lot that teams uh, among teams saying like, we, I guess we really don't make time for learners to do that. So this principal said, you know, we do have a fifth grade capstone project and that's when the children would leave that particular building in this school. Um, she said, but we don't really prepare them to get there. Like we say, now you're in fifth grade, you're gonna do this independent learning project and they write a learning plan, they set goals, they create their own resource list. Anyway, shorter version of the story is that they decided to back it up and start to build those expert learning skills all the way through the K through five years so that that capstone was really a capstone and not an introduction into expert learning. Um, so wow, that's, that's some great very stuff. powerful, very powerful. Fabulous. Thank you. So I do invite again invite you all to to, to find these uh, descriptions, take a look at these descriptions, talk about them in the teams and talk about them with your students. I think it can be really powerful to use UD, leverage UDL and yet leverage these descriptors as a common language that we can develop with our students um, themselves. And so I would like to introduce our next guest today. This is Bill Wil Wilmot, a colleague of mine who's an implementation specialist at CAST. Bill, when we think of expert learning, for whom are we just, are we talking about? How does expert learning differ across disciplines, age groups, contexts, and cultures? Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Allison. Uh, we are talking about uh, all. We're talking about expert, all uh, giving all students the opportunity to become expert learners. So Susan was uh, talking a little bit about this. The first thing I wanna talk about is one of the ways that we use this definition of expert learners um, we have been doing uh, instructional rounds with teams uh, in schools. Small teams will go and observe each other uh, and they'll have one focus question. And the question that we've been starting uh, teams out with is how are classrooms designed to support expert learning for all students? Uh, so built right into kind of the way they're looking at classrooms is this definition uh, of expert learning. Uh, so then we'll take lots of different, uh, all of the observations from that, we'll write up sticky notes as we always do, and we'll start thinking about how what we saw aligns to uh, the guidelines. Uh, and then we'll, we'll answer that question uh, based on what we saw today, imagining that instruction was not going to change at all in our school, to what degree do we believe that our graduates will be expert learners? Uh, and in what ways? So what will be areas of strength for them as expert learners? And what will be areas of growth uh, for them as expert learners? And so it really forces us to look carefully at that, uh, at those descriptors of an expert learner and think about what did we see in the design of instruction that we think is going to lead to these uh, characteristics uh, in learners. Uh, and so it's a really helpful, really useful way of thinking about the connection between uh, what do we see in the design and, and what is going to be the impact uh, for learners. And when we do that, we come up with areas of growth uh, and then we will pick an area that we wanna focus on. And one thing that I've noticed in doing this with lots of different teams uh, over time is that they often will pick uh, uh, areas in that engagement column. So um, that uh, learners are eager for new learning, uh, that they know how to set challenging goals for themselves, uh, that they monitor and, uh, and regulate emotion. So that's often kind of one of the first places that they go. And linking back to the conversation uh, that Allison and Susan were having earlier, um, often teams will say, well, they're, they're fairly goal-directed when we give them a goal. Uh, but, but they don't often know how to set challenging goals for themselves. Um, and I had this great uh, opportunity to work with uh, teachers in Sweden, and we were looking carefully at the guidelines and the, and the language and the translation, and we were translating the word, we we're talking about the translation of the word options. So on the guidelines it says provide options for self-regulation, provide options uh, for executive function. And they said, well, the word that we use in Swedish, if we translated that back into English, really that's more properly translated as opportunities. And so just along the lines of what Susan was saying, what we're doing with our design is we're providing opportunities for self-regulation. We're providing opportunities 
for physical action, providing opportunities for executive function. So this is really about expert learning for all students. Um, and the other thing that um, this instructional rounds process highlights, it's about expert learning for all teachers as well. Um, in, in so far as we want uh, teachers to model the learning that we want students to do, we have to provide those options and those opportunities for them to take charge of their own learning, to have uh, a high degree of agency uh, in, in how they learn about UDL and how they learn about any, uh, any, new, um, uh, any new field. And Bill, I do want to pause for a moment yeah. because there was a whoa moment <laughs> for one of our participants that was shared. Whoa, that question was big. How do we know if our grads, all grads, I'm going to kind of insert you, you are really emphasizing all, including educators ourselves, we are learners as well, prepare to be expert learners. So I do just want to acknowledge that, yes, this is a really big question and it's hard and it will invite a lot of collaboration and discussion. So I just wanted to, to highlight that woe there and, and now I'll let you continue. <laughs> and so one, one great, uh, um, exciting thing that I'm getting to do right now is work with uh, all of the schools in a district uh, from the, the several elementary schools all the way up through the high school and to ask that question about the graduates of the elementary schools, about the graduates of the middle schools and about the graduates of the high schools uh, is really powerful. And then to take the next step and ask the kindergarten teachers about the graduates of high school Mm -hmm. um, leads right into where we're going uh, next, um, because in in a lot of ways you can, um, uh, you know, first and second graders, third and fourth graders will will kind of go along with the program for the most part, uh, the vast majority of them. Um, but if you don't start building those options and those opportunities uh, to develop expert learning skills, then uh, they're not going to show up in high school. Um, and one of, the, one of the reflections from the high school teachers in this process was, well, ninth grade is too late. Uh, ninth grade is too late to start thinking about how do we create opportunities for uh, learners to become expert learners. So this is just one uh, little highlighted example um, that I saw in a first and second grade classroom. Um, at the end of, uh, of many of the lessons, they each wrote down on a sticky note uh, they drew it if they couldn't uh, if they couldn't write words yet. What stuck with you today? Uh, so from this lesson, just a quick reflection. What stuck with me today? Uh, and then out of that, in this first and second grade classroom, students would set uh, individual goals. They'd put that on another chart, uh, and so they might have a goal uh, in reading or uh, how they wanted to improve their their reading. Then they created uh, their own little library of. Uh, of digital content. So they would pair up with each other. They would uh, record videos of themselves reading a story. Uh, and then they would create QR codes that the other students could go and scan and, uh, and then access that video if they wanted to see a video of a story read rather than uh, reading it themselves. And each of those students had a specific reading goal that they were working on. And those partners, those pairs, would give each other feedback on those uh, reading goals. I think that you read much more smoothly uh, this time, that your pace was really good. I think that your expression was really excellent. Um, they would give each other feedback uh, after they had made those, uh, those recordings. So the idea that, uh, that this is reserved for uh, high school or we'll get to expert learning when we're, uh, when we're in college uh, is, is just not true. Uh, we have to build those opportunities in for goal setting, for reflection, for making decisions uh, early on. Um, what, what I was thinking when Susan was talking about making choices is that's a skill, uh, being able to make a good, uh, a good decision. Uh, and like learning to drive a car, uh, you can't make a good decision uh, without making decisions, right? You can't learn to drive a car without driving a car. 
Uh, so you have to have those opportunities to make those decisions. And just imagine if we have our first graders with this kind of reflection, goal setting, collaboration, use of technology, imagine by the time they're in higher ed, they're going to demand more. Uh, they're going to be creating and developing and collaborating so much more. So as someone noted, this, this applies to higher ed and beyond. This is again for all learners uh, and really thinking about how we are pushing in that in the different disciplines, in our different contexts. And this is giving us a common language now to really be able to share what we mean by expert learning. So um, I'm, I'm glad we started early on with the distinction uh, between good students and expert learners. Uh, I think that's an incredibly important uh, distinction. And I think one area where, uh, where there's a, a temptation to conflate those a little bit is when you start thinking about expert learners in specific disciplines. Um, so I, I like to think about this, about you know, what is an expert learner uh, in science, not in a science class. Uh, so I'll use a science example because I, um, I, I taught science and so that's what I'm best qualified to talk about. Uh, but I'm hoping other panelists and certainly in the chat people will jump in to think about what does it mean to be an expert learner in a particular uh, discipline? Uh, one thing in, this, in, in science to highlight uh, are uh, in the next generation science standards, the science and engineering practices are actually a great outline of what it means to be an expert learner in science and engineering. Um, and it really takes very seriously this idea of thinking beyond a classroom to think about what uh, does it mean to be a scientist. So I really think about this question of how would a scientist think about uh, and, and act in the world. Scientists love to, to, to explore questions through experimentation and modeling. Engineers love to solve problems. How do we create opportunities for learners to do that uh, in our science classrooms? Uh, and not see them as bounded by the walls of those classrooms, but uh, create opportunities for them to stretch beyond uh, those uh, those uh, walls. Uh, one thing that has always irritated me as a, uh, as a teacher uh, is the reliance on uh, textbooks. And I think that uh, textbooks are excellent reporters of scientific uh, knowledge, uh, but, but actually that's not what scientists do. Uh, they don't report scientific knowledge. Um, they design experiments. Uh, they ask questions. Uh, so creating uh, time and, and opportunity for students to create original experiments or even replicate uh, original experiments or read about the scientists who created these original experiments, so much more powerful than reading about the result of the synthesized result of uh, those experiments uh, 200 years later. So uh, primary sources are, uh, are kind of fully integrated into the thinking of uh, history classrooms, social studies classrooms, uh, just as much uh, they should be integrated and, and thought about in the context of science classrooms, both written resources and original ongoing research, creating opportunities for uh, learners to, to participate in those. Even, even um, biographies of scientists can, uh, can be helpful in that, uh, in that regard. And that may be a way to, to transition into thinking not just along the discipline, but then also how do we bring in cultural values and opportunities in our learning? Yeah, I, I think this is incredibly important. And, and my thinking about this got uh, so much deeper when I was uh, doing a training with higher ed faculty in a teacher preparation program. And I uh, introduced the, the concept of expert learning. We did some I did an activity to, to highlight what it looks like, sounds like, feels like. Uh, and one of the faculty members who was an anthropologist by training, I uh, just took a second to step back and said, you know, in some cultures, uh, sharing with other people and engagement with a community, sharing your expertise would be a central part of what's considered being an expert. Um, and that doesn't really appear on this definition of uh, expert learning. So it sent me into this, uh, you know, off thinking about, well, to what degree is this a, an academically focused uh, definition of expert, uh, of expertise and expert learning? 
to what degree is it an American uh, description of expert learning or Western description? What racial, ethnic, cultural biases are built into the, into the dis, uh, description of expert learning? What class biases are built into that? Um, I think those are incredibly important questions. We, we just started exploring those, as Allison uh, talked about at the, at the last symposium. To me, that's a, a, an important area of critique of this uh, definition of, ex, of an expert learner. Um, and uh, is, it, is it including everyone? Uh, and is it going far enough? And that's a big question yeah. that we're inviting you all to continue one. to think about with us and to engage in conversations. We have an international audience. We have a wonderfully diverse experience with um, the almost 200 folks that we have with us right now. So please feel free to engage with us in the chat box. Please feel free to Twitter with to tweet with us. And this does this conversation is not going to end today. It's going to continue as we continue th to think about how we might. Uh, think about expert learning uh, in, in our own context, but also how might we articulate the values of expert learning for what purposes and toward what ends. And I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague Jenna Gravel, who is our Director of Research and Curriculum for Professional Learning, to really help us push a little bit on this thinking about expert learning and some of the conversations we've been having at CAST and with the field. Thank you, Jenna, for being here today. Thanks so much, Allison. I'm really excited to be a part of this conversation. Um, but in terms of this question, how might we articulate the values of expert learning? For what purposes and toward what ends? I think this is a really um, critical question for us to be considering. And I've had the opportunity to be a part of the development of our UDL guidelines and our characterization of expert learning since the original version of the guidelines way back in 2008. And I really feel like this question, really thinking about um, the values of expert learning. What is it that we're really working towards? I think that's a really um, pressing next level of work for us. So I'm excited to kind of start, um, or I guess continue uh, thinking about this question. Um, but as an organization, we are continuing to work to develop the notion of expert learning. Now, so if you don't mind just going back one slide, um, I just want to give a sense of kind of this iterative work that goes into the evolution of the guidelines. We're always working to um, iterate based on new insights and feedback from the field. And I think at CAST, we're kind of striving to be an expert learning organization ourselves, where we kind of see the framework of the guidelines as um, a continual kind of process of updating and renewal. Um, and in 2008, um, I think this kind of graphic that we he have here um, really kind of shows this iterative process that we take. You'll see that we came out um, in 2008 with the original version of the guidelines, which we call version 1.0. And since then, we've developed three other versions reflecting different structural and content changes, all based on research and based on um, the feedback that we're receiving from collaborating with practitioners. And even after these uh, four versions, we are still in this iterative mode. We're constantly seeking collaboration from diverse stakeholders to really help us refine and further develop the UDL framework and more specifically this notion of expert learning. And I think um, some of the most recent feedback from the field is really supporting us to reflect on this question that you just posed, Allison, to really start articulating the values of expert learning and to kind of push us to more closely examine the purposes and the goals of expert learning. Uh, and specifically, there's really been um, a growing call from researchers and practitioners alike to more explicitly develop UDL kind of in general and expert learning more specifically to address the persistent inequalities that exist within educational systems but really within our society more broadly. So I wanted to just kind of give, um, give everyone a sense of this feedback um, that we're taking really seriously and so thankful that we're receiving and really kind of thinking about this feedback as we look ahead to future iterations of the guidelines and of this notion of expert learning. So um, the first piece of feedback to share with you is researchers, um, we're going to highlight Federico Waitler and Kathleen Kingsorius right now, but there are several researchers who are kind of pushing us to um, think about uh, expert learning kind of through this lens of equity. And Federico and Kathleen have really um, supported us and kind of offered to us what they call a loving critique of UDL 
and of expert learning more, uh, get more specifically. But they're supporting us to consider the intersection of UDL and culturally sustaining pedagogy, and they really um, pushed us and encouraged us to kind of extend the goals of expert learning and to really nurture expert learners who interrogate multiple forms of oppression and who apprentice to be key participants in a pluralistic democracy. And I think this is a really uh, strong example of this call from the field to kind of support us to kind of take this equity lens as we look to further develop the characterization that we currently have of expert learning. And we're also kind of hearing this call uh, from practitioners and researchers uh, at different conferences too. And so this, um, this quote that we have here is from a conference, um, the International Summit held by the UDL Implementation and Research Network. And this is um, Liz Berkowitz, who's a UDL advocate and a professional development coordinator. And she's really pushing us to think at the heart of UDL is the charge to disrupt inequities. And that has just been a really powerful mes message for us. And I know for lots of people in the UDL field, when we think about this notion of expert learning and how we might refine it in the future, and she's really working to challenge and support educators to apply UDL in ways that are reducing barriers and increasing equitable learning experiences for all learners. And then, as Allison mentioned uh, at the beginning of this webinar, we were also really hearing this call um, at our UDL symposium that we had last year. I think throughout the symposium, it was a really kind of open and honest dialogue about the ways that we were kind of celebrating expert learning in the field, but also where we need to be kind of pushing as a field and kind of rethinking, um, like Bill mentioned, the different biases that may be inherent in the current definition of expert learning. Uh, so we were really thankful to also, within our symposium, have a community forum on the last day where we all came together to have, again, like an open dialogue um, to really uncover some of the gaps in our current thinking around expert learning. And again, one of these gaps really focused on thinking about equity. And there were particip participants there who were kind of urging us to examine the ways that expert learning might um, kind of work to help help us and support learners to begin dismantling different forms of discrimination that have served to really marginalize different learners and how we can use expert learning and the UDL framework more generally as kind of a lever for change. And this I'm so just going to here because you're sharing some really hard questions for us to really think yeah. about. When I think um, when I was in the classroom and I think of some of my practices it's very easy to get excited about who the instruction is working for. But the question of who is our instruction not working for and really taking the time and using the community that we have with our, our other educators, with folks in the community to really think about how we're ensuring that our design is really in service of equitable learning opportunities for every single individual can be overwhelming sometimes to think about. And so I do want to recognize that and I hope that you all continue to share with us um, how you're opening this conversation up in safe ways that are supporting the educators themselves and are supporting this focus on the design and this focus on the development of the expert learners and empowering the student voices. So I did just want to take a moment to acknowledge and, and thank you for really pressing on this definition to make sure that we really are reaching every student in the, in the globe, in the world. So are there other thoughts that either Susan, Bill, or anyone uh, would like to share from in, in the chat box? Uh, Susan, thank you. Um, I just want to add that um, a lot of my work over the years has been with learners with labels of disability. And I notice sometimes in this work that as we're talking about expert learning and educators are getting excited about really rethinking design, um, that sometimes, unfortunately, they're still thinking that learners with disabilities are not really eligible to be like that kind of expert learner, maybe a little bit, but, but I think in some ways there's this irony that the kids for whom the system has not really been working have almost needed to develop their expert learning like um, armor, right? They've become expert learners because they've had to figure out how to survive. So they, like, they couldn't just do it the way the teacher said, they had to kind of find another way. 
So it's just really interesting. And I think it's really, really critical that at this point, when we're talking about universal design for learning and expert learning, that we make sure that every single solitary learner is at the table, even her, even him, even the kid that right now isn't even in the school system because we haven't figured it out. Not that he can't be or she can't be, that we haven't figured it out. So that who are we forgetting? Who are we not inviting into this expert learning conversation and how do we get them there? Because some of that has some system change implications. And I think that that's a piece of this work as well. So to that end, we want to invite you into this conversation to continue this conversation. What's missing in CAS current description of expert learning? Jenna, do you want to continue to share some thoughts on this? Sure, I think maybe to just kick us off, I think um, kind of this call from the field that I just shared to really push us to examine expert learning through this lens of equity. I see that, and I know we've got lots of colleagues here at CAS who also see that as a really critical next level of work for us. Um, but we'd love to hear what all of you are thinking too and what you feel like might be missing from our current uh, description of expert learning or maybe what's kind of there but needs to be more explicit. Um, we'd love to kind of hear from all of you and, and learn from you. So maybe we'll use, uh, feel free to kind of use the chat feature and share any other thoughts that you might have in terms of ways that we might be able to continue to iterate on this definition of expert learning. I think there have been, there have been some really important comments in here on thinking about instructional design, on thinking about creating opportunities. And I want to appreciate how the focus is not on deficits of learners, but barriers in the environment, as Susan talked about at the very beginning, that we're really thinking about the barrier being in the environment and, and not a deficit for the learner. Um, I think another, another point that I, I want to, to emphasize that's been in the chat is that we're really providing these opportunities to develop into expert learners. Bill, do you want to add to that? Yeah, one thing that I always come back to in, um, in this definition is the phrase goal-directed. And this is one of those where it feels like uh, a little bit we can, we can start conflating good student and uh, expert learner. Um, whose goal? Uh, first of all, is a big question. Is it just the teacher's goal? What about the learner's goals? Um, but there's there's a there's a part of being a goal directed learner um, that I don't know if it's fully represented here, although I'm sure you can see it in places of kind of discovering goals, like happening upon. Uh, oh, this is an interesting thing that I'd like to explore more. Um, so how do we? Uh, make sure that we're not kind of cutting out that exploratory uh, learning, um, which sometimes is more more akin to play uh, than it is to uh, learning your math facts in a classroom um, when we talk about goal-directed uh, learners. And um, I'm not just uh, making this up. We, we had the opportunity before the last symposium to have David Rose come and, uh, and talk with us about expert learning and what he uh, what his thoughts on it were and kind of how, how we arrived at that um, formulation or this formulation. And that was the first place that he went was to talk about play and kind of the learning experience that, uh, uh, that is embodied in, uh, in play. And play never just ends. There was a question, you know, is there ever this ultimate mastery point where you're almost like, got it. <laughs> and there's really not, you know, when you think of developing mastery. Um, so we're from New England, the New England Patriots have a quarterback, Tom Brady, who's been very successful, but he keeps going, you know, he continues to push his mastery. Um, so I, I don't think that that's ever done. And part of being an expert learner is recognizing that opportunity to continue to grow and push and iterate um, and, to con and, and to continue beyond. There, there was a question in here about how does this fit in with the standardized testing? And, and I think my thought would be, I don't see standardized testing as expert learning. So I, I think that's it's almost um, a different direction to, think about um, what is the, the, the goal of the standardized testing and is that the goal that we have for the development of expert learners? I think those are probably two different things. 
Um, one more comment. Yeah, yes. go ahead, Bill. Yeah. And can I add to that, Allison, that I, I was just looking at the accommodations that are available for uh, standardized testing in New Hampshire because we're doing work in New Hampshire. In addition to the accommodations that are available to some learners, there are what they call universal tools which are available to everyone. Um, and it led me immediately to think that if, if, uh, if, if learners have never had the option uh, to use a different tool than what uh, is the default, they won't. They won't pull up those uh, universal tools. So uh, being an expert learner informs how you engage with and kind of uh, uh, optimizes how you engage with even standardized testing. And, and to this point, that was also mentioned in the chat that aligns with what you're saying, Bill, the goal is not necessarily to remove the tools or strategies, but to know when and how to use them. And if we don't give them those opportunities in the first place, they won't know when or how to really be able to, uh, to make uh, expert choices in their learning. Jenna, um, I'm going to turn this quote over to you. If that's all right, or Bill, I'm sorry, I'm going to turn this quote over to you. Sure, <laughs> sorry, absolutely. <Jenna. laughs> you know, so this is a uh, quote from uh, a, from a person who's on a team that I was working with um, learning UDL. Uh, this is kind of a reflection on their, their first year of learning UDL. You know, they, this is from a person who dove right in um, and started offering options and started uh, doing flexible seating and all kinds of things right, right from the beginning. Uh, and pretty quickly realized that that, uh, that that he had kind of launched a boat without uh, any uh, rudder. Um, and his reflection halfway through the year was we, we started linking everything uh, that we were doing to the con concept of expert learning. He's talking about his team. We taught our learners to think metacognitively about what works best for them. They're part of this too. Learners need to be a part of their own learning. So it really, for him, gave a rudder to uh, learning about UDL and thinking about what am I going to do with, uh, with UDL. So to think strategically about what kinds of options and opportunities uh, am I offering in the design of my, uh, of my curriculum and learning experiences? And how do I really ground that in the outcomes that I want, right? In the in specific expert learner uh, outcomes. What, what is my expert learner goal today? Or what are their expert learner goals today? Uh, so I, I yeah. I appreciate how they're working as a team, but they're inviting the students themselves, as you're saying, into that conversation. So it's really about that mastery and that process as opposed to the teacher giving what he or she thinks is what's needed. It's just a really, it sounds so simple, but it really can transform your classrooms and your systems. It is fundamentally a different structure. Uh, we, we just to jump in, Allison, to say, though, I think we have to let go as teachers because if we want learner voices to be like, heard, um, we have to let that learner use the resource that's not perfect or the tool that's not really going to do the job and let them have that opportunity to make decisions like, I have a better idea. This book might not be the right one for me, or maybe I should be over there. And I think, and I know for myself, you know, I have alphabetized spice racks. Like, it's really hard to let go, right, and to not have that sense of control. Um, but it's a big barrier to learners, like we are big barriers to learners becoming expert learners because we care so much and we want them to have that success and that, oh my gosh, I got it. So I think that's a piece of the puzzle too. It's fabulous. Thank you. Please learn more. We invite you to learn more. We shared this at the beginning. I know Mindy's been sharing it throughout in the chat. We have all of these resources we've been talking about, that expert learner chart, the description of expert learner is really well described in the UDL theory and practice book by Meyer, Rose, and Gordon. The article that inspired cast characterization of expert learners in there. We have a top five tips to foster expert learning. So please feel free to explore the resources that are in there because we really hope to take action with you. We wanna know your ideas around expert learning in UDL. You can be in touch with us directly via email if that's more comfortable for you. There's Jenna, there's Susan, there's Bill. I'm Allison. Please be in touch with us on social media at cast underscore UDL and hashtag castpl. Your voice helps us iterate and learn and continue to be more of an expert organization as well as we think about crafting this next iteration of the UDL guidelines. 
We are super excited to announce that our sixth annual CAST UDL Symposium is going to be another opportunity for us to come together and share about this. Jenna, do you want to um, take a moment to share what the theme is with everyone? Oh, I'm so excited that I get to be the one to announce this. Yeah. Um, but we're really thrilled to announce our sixth annual UDL Symposium with a theme focused on UDL and equity. And as I was saying before, this has been a really strong call from the field to start examining expert learning and UDL more broadly through this um, really critical lens. So we're really excited to come together as a field and learn together. So please save the date from August 5th through the 7th. We'd love to see you there. It's here in Boston. And we actually, um, we can put in... We can put in one other plug too that we're going to be launching our call for proposals. Um, I won't give a, a hard date, I'm not exactly sure when, but in the very near future. And we'd love for all of you uh, to be thinking about proposals that you might want to submit to be able to share your thinking around UDL and equity with the field. Fantastic. And Boston is beautiful in the summer, so please come join us in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And let's continue this conversation. This is, again, just the beginning of the learning. We do, we thank you all for joining us today. And as a, a sign of thanks, we have a code, no limits 25 for a 25% uh, discount through December 31st on one of the newest skinny books that's out using formative assessment by Michael Connell. So order your copy today. It's a great book and, and we want you to be able to take advantage of a little savings and please keep in touch with us. We have a cast newsletter that goes out where we really share a lot of the, the work that's going on in CA, at cast where we're trying to reduce inequities and support learning for every individual in all sorts of different contexts. So learn more about some of the projects that we're engaged in and we are always looking for ways to collaborate with the field with you all so this cast newsletter is the best way to keep up to date with what's happening here at cast so we invite you to sign up and join our newsletter we do want to end with a quote uh, jenna i'll let you share this quote from kathleen and federico yeah, this is just one more quote that's really been pushing us as an organization to think about the next level of work when we think about the conceptualization of expert learning. Um, and Federico and Kathleen have stated, UDL will benefit from expanding its definition of an expert learner with a more critical and reflective stand that supports teachers and students in dismantling intersecting forms of oppression. So I think there's our charge. There's our, one of the pieces of our next level of work for sure. We look forward to working with you all on that, on that next level of work. So thank you all so much for joining today. I want to thank our captioner, Kara, Mindy for being on the back channel, Allie Berg for helping with all of the technical support, Susan, Bill, and Jenna, thank you so much for the conversation today. And for those of you who join live, Thank you so much. This is one of the most active webinar chats that I've seen, and I really we appreciate your voices. We will take your suggestions very seriously. Please know that the conversation is still going for us, and we look forward to next steps. If you would like to give us feedback on this webinar or offer suggestions for other webinars that we might have in the future, here is a bit.ly that you can use to be able to share some of that feedback. We would really appreciate it. From us here in Boston to you all, thank you so much for joining and we look forward to being in touch.
Can you guys hear me? We still have about 62 participants on. Oh my gosh. Thanks, Allison. You did a great job facilitating. <laughs>